Hello, everyone. Welcome to this phase two of our webinar on the impacts of the war in Ukraine on women globally. I'm Preeti Daruka. I'm the global coordinator with BRICS Feminist Watch. And today, uh, along with Shalmali Gutal of uh, Focus on Global South, we will be moderating this uh, webinar. So welcome everyone uh, to this. Just a little bit of a background. We have a full house of experts, so I won't take too much of your time. I know everyone is eager to listen to what others have to say. But I just wanted to set a little bit of a context that the idea of the webinar series came from the need to capture women's voices and live realities worldwide and to bring feminist analysis to emerging global trends. Uh, and therefore, a number of feminist organizations, both in the North as well as South, came together. So we are really happy to partner with Wide Plus and IDOS in Europe and with many other organizations, including uh, Focus on the Global South and uh, members of BRICS Feminist Watch to host the series of webinar. When we started planning for the webinar, we realized how different our perspective were. And it was therefore we felt it would be best to have this webinar as a series, as a two part series. The phase one of the webinar, which was held two days back, I hope many of you attended it, was particularly focused on women's voices from Europe. The phase two, which uh, we are glad to host today, is focused on voices and experiences and analysis of women and girls from the global south. The two-part online seminar aimed to bring together women's lived reality feminist analysis around the world in context of war in Europe and an increasing militarization in the world. These webinars are also a space to raise concern from diverse perspectives and to build feminist solidarity against disturbing emerging global trends. The war's devastating impact is being felt not just in Eastern Europe, but across the developing world too. The shortage of essential things has dramatically impacted the political economy of vulnerable countries in the global south. There is therefore a need to understand the discourse on war from the perspective of women's lived realities in countries of the global south. Is the war in Ukraine the beginning of third world war? Is this an emergence of another Cold War-like situation? The US and its allies have led in unprecedented sanctions against Russia, but many countries in the Global South have not signed on to them. There are various reasons why several countries prefer an approach which is neither pro-Russia nor pro-US or pro-NATO. The war has also resulted in a series of global energy crises. And disappointingly, several countries, we are seeing a, a really disturbing trend. Many rich countries, many European countries have turned towards dirty energy sources, including coal. And there is also an increased investment towards fossil fuel infrastructure to meet energy needs. So this, of course, will have devastating uh, impact on climate. It also exposes uh, how countries are dealing with uh, war-created crisis. There is an increase in total global military expenditure by almost 0.7%. This has resulted, the financing gap to build social protection floor has widened by approximately 30% since the onset of COVID-19 crisis. The financing gap significantly impacts the well-being and access to basic needs for women and girls across different groups. So the priority of the countries globally is towards militarization and military, but increase in military budget. And what does that mean to, for women and girls on the ground? Globally, the world is being divided at various levels. Therefore, it becomes crucial to understand how war dynamic impacts multiple global trends and how it is resulting in direct or collateral damages to lives of women and girls across the world. So today, of course, before we start the phase two, I thought it would be a good idea to just recap the 
uh, key points from the phase one, which was held uh, on two days ago, which captured the experiences from um, three countries in Europe, Ukraine, Russia, and Poland. Feminist speakers from these countries shared their experiences and firsthand ex observations. Uh, feminists from Ukraine noted that war led to glorification of men's role as soldiers, but has also reinforced gender division of labor, which has led to increase in which has also led to increase in domestic violence. In the context of bigger problems, that is the war, women concerns and suffering get overshadowed. There's an increase in all forms of crime, including sexual assault, as well as human trafficking. War has also led to some positive democratic development within Ukraine, and it has also led to acknowledgement of women's contribution in defense efforts and humanitarian aid. Women are also on the forefront of providing these services. War, the women's role in war has not dis disappeared. There have various opportunities that have emerged for sure, but women's care responsibilities have increased. Women shared several examples where feminist movements have come together and have developed common statements and also shared their feminist manifesto. In Russia, we heard the continued censorship and repression of NGOs that create a very difficult environment for these conversations to happen. However, it was really heartening to hear uh, feminist anti-war resistance that provided humanitarian support to Ukrainian uh, deported from Russia and increased support within Russia uh, that advocated against the war and hoping to restore peace. We also heard about from feminists from Poland who had accepted uh, Poland, you know, is one of the countries which got the largest number of Ukrainian refugees. So it was about 6 million refugees um, have been accepted by Poland. So a uh, po uh, Polish feminist shared how Poland has been coping with the challenge and how feminists have been providing support uh, to the women and children coming from Ukraine in solidarity. It was shared how there was a mutual learning in that process. Uh, as Poland, we know, has a right-wing government and they don't have necessarily very progressive sexual reproductive rights uh, and health uh, policies, whereas Ukrainian women coming from a country which have provided much more progressive uh, provisions in that regard. So these were the key points which emerged from the phase one of our um, of our webinar. And I would like to now hand it over to Shalmi to take us through and welcome everyone to this phase two of our webinar. Okay. Um, thank you, Preeti. Can you all hear me okay? I'm audible and visible. Yes. Okay, good. All right. All right. So welcome again uh, from me. Uh, I'm, as, I, as you know, with Focus on the Global South and a member of the BRICS Feminist Network. Uh, what, now that we have a lineup of speakers and discussants today uh, who are all from, uh, who are all feminist backgrounds and they are feminist scholars, feminist activists, feminist social movement members uh, from a variety of, uh, and a range of backgrounds. Uh, we have peace activists, people working on transitional justice, on food sovereignty, agroecology, um, on paleobiology. We have environmentalists and political ecologists and political economists. Uh, we have people working on the issues of mining and debt um, and international relations, geopolitics and foreign policy between the BRICS countries. Um, and also those who have worked in a number of uh, on a number of different fronts and a number of conflictual situations, uh, both domestically, regionally, and regionally, but also and then internationally and globally. So the way we will structure the our, our webinar today is that we will take three speakers first, and then one discussant. Uh, the first, the three speakers will present perspectives on their analyses of what's happening 
uh, with the war, the Russia-Ukraine war in terms of um, triggers, geopolitical angles, um, but most important in terms of the experiences uh, in the global South. And then we'll have one uh, discussant as a, to add and to knit some of the key points that are coming together. Then we'll move into a short session of looking at questions um, and comments that are coming in from our participants. And then we'll move into the second part with uh, two more speakers and a discussant um, as we've done in the first round. And again, then we will take a little time to look at questions and comments from the participants. I don't know if we will have enough time for all participants to be able to read out or to speak and comment um, or to ask their questions directly. So I request all of the, all the participants to please write your questions in the chat, in the Q&A box there, you know, if you look at the bottom, of your screen, you will see um, there is there there's a Q and A box, and there is also a chat box. So you could for questions specifically and comments uh, that you would like responded, please write those in the Q and A box, and we will bring them up from there. Um, now, without further ado, let me go into uh, to introduce our first speaker, who is Shreen Sarur from Sri Lanka. I'm not going to read out the bio and the you know introduction of all the speakers and uh, discussants because these are really they, they have very impressive bios and uh, backgrounds that could be discussed so these are going to be posted in the chat so if you look at the chat now uh, our colleague Gia has already posted uh, the introduction of Shreen Abdul Sarur so you could read that from there and let me hand the floor over to Shreen. Shreen over to you thank you Thank you very much. Thank you, Priti, and the entire team who put together this event. I hope I'll be able to uh, do justice because I'm connecting from a remote area with my phone. Uh, um, so, I'll, I mean, Sri Lanka is um, now very well known for one for its economic crisis. The other one is for the people's struggle, the people's struggle that chased away uh, Rajapaksha's the, the ruling family and made two cabinet to resign, uh, finance minister to uh, resign, um, central bank governor to resign, prime minister to resign, ultimately the president to go to hide and then he has to run away and he has to resign. And then now we have a new president. It is just a change of, um, you know, another person. I mean, the system changed that uh, the well-known Aragalaya, the struggle that asked for it has not happened in Sri Lanka. Very interestingly, the new president, Ranil Vikramasinghe, who came into power, is all about reviving uh, the, the political party that supported Rajapaksha's and the president is back. He came back, the president who ran away, came back on the uh, 3rd of September. And it's very sad. I don't know the world knows what happened in Sri Lanka because the world got inspired by Sri Lanka. There are over 3,500 uh, lead uh, uh, people who struggle uh, asking for justice, asking for system change, asking for anti-corruption, uh, recovery of assets that uh, the leaders have stolen. And uh, over 3,500 people have been arrested out of them about 1500 are incarcerated three students leaders are charged under prevention of terrorism act which is a dark hole actually which has been used against minorities since 1978 uh, 79 in this country um so in that background uh, sri lanka also yesterday got un high commissioner's report which is very uh, uh, daring and very uh, challenging to the Sri Lankan government and uh, the, ha the Human Rights Council session is happening and the Sri Lanka is in number two in the agenda, they are for 12th of September, the first day itself, Sri Lanka will be taken up for debate and thereafter we expect uh, a new resolution. Um, in that context, I want to present some of the current status economic crisis and what has happened to the country. So now the protests that you all got inspired didn't come overnight. 
Now, for many years after the end of the war, women in the North and the East, particularly the Tamil women, have been protesting. And some of the mothers have disappeared, about 1,000 to 1,200 of them have been protesting for over 2,000 days on the roadside, demanding for their children who have been surrendered to the Sri Lankan state military at the end of the war. So there was that struggle. And there was another struggle by women's group, women, affected women in the North, particularly, of the military takeover of their land, right? Here where I'm sitting, whenever I go out, what I see is military cultivating, military doing tourism, military occupying uh, fertile grounds, right? Uh, military is doing civil administration. There are enough checkpoints that one need to pass and it's heavily militarized, right? So women have been questioning why after the end of the war, we need to have uh, so many military men in the area which belongs to us, our homeland, right? Every three family, there is one military man and predominantly the military is Sinhalese. They don't speak Tamil. Uh, this area that I belong to is the north where uh, it's Tamil speaking people are majority, right? Then the other struggle is with regard to prevention, the very prevention of terrorism act, where minority communities have been taken under custody, mostly young men as terrorists and have been put behind bar without any trial for over 15 years in the Tamil people's case. After the Easter attack, the Muslims have been targeted as terrorists and they are without any proper child for the last three and a half years, right? So these struggles, then after that, we also saw because of the economic crisis, the power cuts we had, uh, you know, the power cuts for sometime for, you know, 14 hours, 15 hours, we didn't have fuel, we didn't have gas, cooking gas, we didn't have um, basic food, no milk powder. The, 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 the mismanagement of the then president Gotabe Rajapaksha of overnight making a decision, uh, banning any form of chemical fertilizer, fertilizer caused a calamity. The entire agriculture sector just completely failed. Then we uh, our cash crop, that is the tea, which grew on the rocks, couldn't come on normal, I mean, organic fertilizer, and they didn't have organic fertilizer to substitute. So then the, the president brought in the military to do organic fertilizer, and that also completely failed, right? So then there is also the decision with regard to various investment, bringing in various countries and selling the resources, vanity projects that Raj, Mahinda Rajapaksha, the previous president, did with China, all of those things never brought any revenue to the country. So therefore, we started borrowing, borrowing, borrowing. And early this year, Sri Lanka failed to pay its debt. So therefore, Sri Lanka became bankrupt, right? Currently, in, our food inflation is about 100%, right? And our transport in, inflation is 150%. Um, a family need 100,000 with a family of four, which could have been last year is um, 40,000 rupees, right? So it is very heavy cost of living. Every three household in 10 household is suffering of malnutrition. UNICEF has estimated 2.3 million Sri Lankan children are urgently need humanitarian assistance, right? Uh, and Sri Lanka's National Food uh, Security Project talks about 100,000 families are malnourished and 75,000 families are trying to you know, struggle, avoiding starvation and death. And out of that, 40,000 families are receiving food and nutrition via saline, right? So this is our food insecurity and, uh, you know, we also had short supply of medicine. Many people died of... Uh, that short supply of medicine that also came with the COVID management, uh, how military, the military task force appointed by President Gotabe Rajapaksha managed the COVID. Therefore, they made, uh, military made decision with regard to COVID vaccination, medicine, reorder, nutritional products that we gave it to lactating mothers, pregnant mothers, all those things were stopped as non-essential uh, service and the military's way of managing also 
one reason why we had uh, lots of people dying of you know, med emergency medical assistance not being given, right? And very interestingly, you know, Sri Lanka has to go to IMS. IMF right now, we have come to a staff level agreement. And many of us women have been asking why Sri Lanka has 2% of the GDP allocated for military when we don't have active war in this country. And much of this GDP, 2% goes to Western countries for Sri Lanka to buy weapons, right? And also to feed our oversized military, which has not, uh, we have not done any demobilization after the end of the war, right? So therefore, militaries engage in all sorts of businesses also in Sri Lanka. Very interestingly, Sri Lanka spends only 0.6% for social protection or social security. Right, we are very far behind any other countries uh, in the global south, also with regard to social protection. Yeah. Sheen, now, I'm sorry, interestingly, I have to ask you to start wrapping up. I'm sorry that I. Okay, uh, so interestingly, so the, the IMF just uh, quick, uh, uh, because of the one. IMF alone, yeah. Sri Lankan government is cutting down on various social social welfare and also restructuring. So the one thing that they have done is a direct uh, tax uh, increase uh, that add to the food inflation and very interestingly two things they have done that you all need to do one is taking away the bar of women migrating sri lanka gets dollars because of women going to migrate you know middle eastern country under very very dangerous condition now there is no age limit so even the 18 year old can go to uh, middle eastern country without any protection so they wanted to put all our women into plane and send so per day over thousand women are migrating to middle eastern countries for work then the other labor law, first revision of the labor law that is happening in Sri Lanka, shock and office ordinance that prevented women to work in the night. Now women have to work, women can work in the night under no protection whatsoever. Right. So interestingly, much of the even our electricity uh, rate has increased. And if you look carefully, look at it, 30 unit people are paying more mobile than the biggest amount of consumer. So these are going to impact women very badly. So some of the IMF's restructuring, we are very worried that women are going to pay the price and women are going to be uh, you know, earning to repay the debt that men, when the men have taken all the money and you know, the, uh, bankrupt the country. Thank you very much. Thank you, Shreen. And my apologies to that I have to bring up the time, but you know, that this will happen. And I think Shreen has pointed out, uh, you know, in, in great detail, uh, some of, you know, some of the key kinds of impacts that uh, women and girls will face in moments of crisis and war and the continuing legacies of these kind of conflicts, uh, which are multidimensional. Uh, because there is the actual, of course, violence of war, but then there is also the economy of war and what it does to social, uh, you know, in terms of creating paucity for social and other, you know, important economic uh, priorities, which do not get financed because the money is going towards, the, you know, going, is, is going towards debt repayment and it's going towards buying arms and so on. So without further ado, let me move to our next speaker and I invite... Uh, Professor Hala Barakat from Egypt. Again, you can read her bio in the chat. Thank you. Thank Hala. you. Thank you, Shalmali. Thank you so much. I'll try to keep to the time. And uh, so uh, today I'm, I'm talking about uh, the MENA region. So uh, I, I know that we are talking more about the effect of the Ukraine war on what's happening. But I mean, we have to recognize that we're talking about regions that are, have a chronic lingering uh, food crisis. Uh, of course, the, the recent events, whether the war in Ukraine and before that the pandemic, have just made it more painfully eminent and exposed also um, the situation in a much more uh, clear way. Uh, so that, I mean, the international organization recognized that the food insecurity situation uh, in the region, in the MENA region, is a growing challenge. And, uh, and even from before the pandemic and the Ukraine war. So, for example, there's an estimate that 10%, that the 55 million of the population of the, middle, of the MENA region, the Middle Eastern and North Africa, uh, considered undernourished. Um, 
the agencies, also the numbers say that they, the pandemic, the protracted conflicts and other factors, they have made hunger more common so that 20% of the population fall under the acutely food insecure people. The global percentage is 6%. So this is 14% above the average global of 6%. And I'm sure many of you have read the recent report by the special reporter for the right to food where there's a focus on women because whether in rural or urban context, women are the most likely to be the first to go hungry. They also bear the responsibility of feeding their families. Throughout the MENA region, roles and responsibilities are associated with food security and nutrition. The roles lar largely fall on the shoulders of women and girls. Despite the key roles played by women in food systems, the female-headed households experience severe financial burdens. And these households themselves are more susceptible to food insecurity and a prevalence of malnutrition. So that we have this double burden of uh, malnutrition, uh, whether uh, undernourishment and obesity at 13 and 28%. Across the MENA region, and particularly in countries affected by conflict, the female-headed households, the rural and refugee women, and women living, living with a disability are the most susceptible to food insecurity and most likely to resort to negative coping mechanisms. So we have numbers. We have the numbers that show this situation of food insecurity that target women and girls more than men. In times of crisis, everything is exasperated or is doubled. But what concerns me real today here today is that these numbers fail to recognize the root causes. So they talk of course about overpopulation, diet trends, climate change, are challenge, challenges, but they fail to recognize that gender inequality in the region is a major cause. It's also a challenge and possibly a way to get out of the vicious circle of chronic food insecurity. Gender inequality in the MENA region takes many forms, but at the end, there are the women and girls who are marginalized and discriminated against and those who suffer most in times of crisis. One major obstacle that I see is landlessness. Women in the MENA region, they make up more than 40% of the agricultural workers, but they own on average 5% of the land. During crises, and in case of any kind of aid related to these crises, Women do not have access to loans. They don't have access to extension services, equipment, etc. Nevertheless, they continue to work unpaid on family lands or as paid workers on other people's lands. And the problem is deep rooted and mostly social. Another important factor is unpaid work. The situation, which is found, of course, in many other regions, takes extreme forms in the MENA region and results in uh, food deprivation which is exacerbated during crises. They could be housewives, they could also be house sisters or daughters. They could also be domestic workers. And uh, domestic workers, although they are paid, they suffer from very inhumane situation. And uh, the, uh, the previous uh, speaker uh, talked about Sri Lankan in the Middle East. This is very true. The Middle East has the most of the migrant domestic workers, 1.6 million women work in mostly in the rich Arab states, the Gulf states and the Saudi Arabia. And they are not protected by labor laws. The laws don't apply to them. And they have unfortunately been described as modern slaves. Their living conditions are less than optimal, allowing employers to misuse and abuse their rights and placing house workers particularly migrants and refugees in a state of deprivation, alienation and insecurity on many levels. Particularly in cases of crises, they suffer from food insecurity. The MENA region is also a region of refugees. I've had a first-hand experience working with women refugees in Egypt, in a training center and within the context of improving their nutrition and food security. We did a survey among the women present and it showed that they will always prioritize their children and husband if there is food shortage 
and there is almost always a food short shortage. This is their normal, their norm. They also often go without food the whole day to keep whatever food they get at the center, the training center for their families. And also we must realize that their food intake is limited in variety and low in nutrition because they're often, because of their displacement, they lose pride in their food heritage and they also miss the food items they're used to in their accommodating a country. The third important part of the inequality, gender inequality that affects women, uh, food security, but also on many other levels is sexual and gender-based violence. It's a major problem in the region and takes extreme forms. And some people might think, okay, how does it affect? It affects, it prevents women from going to work, using public transport, working in fields, pursuing their dreams of education. And it can range from verbal harassment to physical violence. The culprits are, can often escape punishment because until recently there were no laws against gender-based violence. Or very often there is a very weak law enforcement. In times of crises, with the loss of jobs, domestic violence is also in the, on the rise. And this is even a more difficult uh, situation to, um, to solve. Uh, another uh, root cause for the inequality and uh, the marginalization discrimination is the accessing services. This applies to rural, but also to urban women. They most often than not, they have difficulty accessing health services, reproductive, mental, and preventive health services, or social protection. So part of it is economic and part of it's social norms. But they are mostly Allah, also women. But yes, I'm, I'm have to request you to wrap, start wrapping up. I'm, I'm wrapping. So they are also mostly part of this informal economy. So they, they really don't have any uh, access to so the ongoing conflict in Ukraine and the resulting disruption in food and fuel and fertilizer markets have, has exacerbated the existing food crisis, but it's already been driven by conflict and climate shocks and COVID and economic pressures and also um, uh, humanitarian crises that have not been dealt with. And millions of women are living actually in state of conflict. They are under occupation. They live in protracted crises. For example, Yemen, Syria, Palestine. So imagine food security for a landless, underpaid, unpaid worker suffering from gender-based violence and living under occupation. Where can we begin? So I believe there is a need to consider many factors and their impacts when planning initiatives to help uh, those who are uh, in situations of crisis, whether it's food insecurity or others. But these initiatives must also look towards long-term um, solutions. Uh, we need to address the social and economic barriers. We need to also uh, give women access and control over their assets and resources and services and enhance their access to decent employment and social protection. Um, and also think about in the future to transform the way we deal with um, solving solutions simply, for example, food systems, uh, agroecology, food sovereignty, uh, solutions that are gender friendly and, and are also dependent on women's and girl, girls' engagement and knowledge. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hala. So Hala is also, also she has pointed out the absolute, uh, you know, the, the, the role, the critical role, the pre-existing conditions and the context with which, you know, the social, political, economic, cultural context that women and girls already face with regards to, you know, their ability to act, their agency, their rights, um, the opportunities that are available to them uh, and how these then exacerbate the violence that comes from war, the social, economical, political violence that comes from war and conflict um, and is imposed and inflicted on territories. And also, especially thank you, Hala, for raising the very important issues of land, food, and um, the terror that's faced, I mean, you know, the continuing terror that is faced by peoples under occupation. Because I think sometimes when there is a, it sounds horrible to say this, but when a new war breaks out or a new conflict breaks out, uh, a lot of the analysis uh, 
in the press and in the mainstream media is as though this has just happened now, you know, as though there are not millions and millions of people who have been facing this again and again. And uh, especially for women and girls who have, you know, who, as you said, you know, they, they face, they, they have multiple burdens and responsibilities. Thank you very much for bringing these up. Now Thank we you, move to, uh, I'd like to have the honor, honor to invite uh, Professor Yu Xiaogang, an old colleague and friend. He's Professor Yu is from China. And uh, Professor Yu, would you like to speak um, your presentation or would you like us to show your video? Because you also sent us a video, so which would you prefer? We don't hear you. Professor, you could you put uh, unmute yourself, please? Uh oh. Ah. Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah, you can. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think um, uh, it's better to present my video. Okay. Because uh, my video is more, you know, uh, time, timely, time keeping. Okay. okay. We can we we can we can do that, Professor Yu. Thank you. Very nice to see you again. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I request <laughs> Jia. Um, yes, please. Yeah, we can't hear. Yeah, no volume. No volume, yeah? Yeah. I think. I think you have to unmute yourself, Jia. War by Russia against ah. Ukraine caused widespread opposition from the domestic society which was the top challenge of the rulers. And the tightened social control was a main task. Second, the reason for direct suppression the domestic anti-war movement are not justified and not easy. Third, it is justified and easier to control society in the name of epidemic prevention. Extreme epidemic prevention can also test the risk of social stability and the loyalty of government systems and the state machines. Politically, there is serious public opinion separation. Many female move star that condemned the war and the cause for peace in the internet was besieged or banned. If don't keep in line with central authority are blasted by the internet or banned on the platform. And they may be labeled Chinese traitors, Western anti-China force and the fifth columns. Although they are just ordinary people express their peaceful wishes. As long as the orientation is followed, the pro-Russian and uh, male-dominant wolf warrior remarks with rude and wargo tongue flooded in the internet. But uh, there is a lot of side effect. Along with wolf warrior remark, many wargo remarks and video mocking Ukrainian women which have a rose hate of Ukrainians and threatened China stay in Ukraine. In addition, many Chinese female journalists working in Western media have abused as female rebel and uh, prostitute faced Chinese women that the white people like, because they are different report with diverse information. Economically, female entrepreneurs 
suffered a blow. Unemployment rate of women has been rising. Generally, more than 50 employees in the female-owned enterprise are women. Before epidemic and the war, the development of trend of small and macro enterprise was friendly to women. As a result of extreme epidemic prevention and the war, social and economic activity are blocked, raw material prices are soaring, and the pressure of housing, rent, and loans is increased. However, the National Economic Rescue Plan is negligible, which makes a large number of small and macro enterprises go bankrupt or closed down, resulting in high unemployment rate of women. Increase in domestic care work. According to the data of National Bureau of Statistics, in 2018, the average hour of women housework in China are 3 hours and 48 minutes, and that for men is 1 hour and 32 minutes. After epidemic, women's working hour increased greatly. According to the survey, 70.7 percent respondent indicate that their household income decreased, while about 60 percent respondent indicate that their household expenditure increased. Due to the higher house debt ratio mortgage in China, 25 percent of respondents said that debt pressure has increased. Women's anxiety and stress. Facing with substantial pressure and uncertainty during the epidemic, women's anxiety increased and their mental health declined. According to survey, more than half of the respondents think that their anxiety level exceeds the six point and the average ancient so, uh, score of the respondent is 6.2 point, range from 0 to 10 points. Gender-based violence. Some female respondents say they suffered gender-based violence. An online survey of more than 10,000 people conducted by non-profit organization shows that 27% of women reported that they had been subjected to some form of violence during the period of epidemic control, and 19 were insulted and abused. It is very difficult to seek medical treatment for domestic violence injury due to social lockdown and the general indifference. Professor Hume? Has... Yes. Yes, thank you very much, Professor Yu. So Professor Yu has brought up, uh, added to our mix of discussion points today, the issue of gender-based violence and the impacts of uh, state and societal uh, forms of violence on, uh, on the personal and the psychological aspects of women and girls being able to exercise agency, but also then on their economic agency in terms of you know uh, their ability to be run enterprises to be economic actors in society and so on so uh, now rather than me knitting all the points together uh, i'd like to invite our first discussant uh, mariama williams to 
share her her observations and her analysis um, of the you know of the Russia Ukraine war from the global south perspective as well as uh, pull out some of the key strings from the speakers that we have heard already. So Mariama, over to you, please. Okay, good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, great. All right, yeah, yeah. so um, welcome everybody. Good afternoon, good night, <laughs> good morning to some of you. I'm currently talking to you from Belgium. So it's about um, 3 p.m. in the afternoon. Um, thank you, Shireen, for talking about the situation in Sri Lanka and Hala for linking up with the Egypt and the MENA region. And uh, Professor Yu, thank you so much for your um, very comprehensive statistical presentation around what's happening with gender and women in, in the China and the region. All right, um, I, I'm, because the other speakers are quite detailed about what's happening at country level or in the region, that's really nice because it prevents me from having to repeat statistics. So I won't repeat statistics. Um, I would just say that um, let's put some points on the table, right? Generally, one is that the event of February 22nd or 24th, 2022, when Russia invaded um, Ukraine, um, occurred upon the heel of very dramatic events in the world economy that weakened. Um, economic growth, weaken the situation of um, fight against poverty, and gender dimensions, all of these are weakened by COVID. And um, the damage from the, this uh, event, and which is still ongoing, and uh, it's now almost, what, five, six months since February, um, that we have no end in sight. So there's a lot of uncertainty and unpredictable in the global economy, both for businesses and households. It's not clear what the end game of the two protractors, the one who was addressed and the aggressor, um, Ukraine was addressed. We, we want to put that on the table that what the Russia did was definitely unconscionable and unjustified. Um, and the destruction of lives in Ukraine um, cannot in any way be re-justified or be um, remedied. But at the same time, we also need to look at the, the response of the global community, um, in particular the US and the EU, um, which response, uh, firstly, for their own, for the protection of Ukraine and for the protection of the EU and the stability of the EU, and the US also because of its NATO power. What was missing, I think, from this response, but, and which has continued to be missing up until the point that we're at today, is any consideration of what this does for the rest of us in the world who are living on the situation of extreme disease from the pandemic, a pandemic just the resolution of which uh, we were we were less than we can be less than cognizant of because the response to the pandemic was that um, the countries that had the wherewithal, uh, withheld those wherewithal from the rest of us, leaving us on our own, despite just two or three years out of the whole agreement on the one left behind, which is the SDGs. And the pandemic, of course, has weakened the um, work around the SDG and certain of the war has done that for poverty, for homelessness, for gender, for climate. And I want to flag those, but I want to put up on the case, my, one of my concerns that I've been looking at is um, what is the end game and how do we factor in that this is not just a, a regional conflict of the others that we discussed, but this is one that has global ramifications and continue to have global ramifications um, on a number of levels, um, food price, climate, and the debt of developing countries. Now the intent seems to be to choke the, the policy and the response to choke the Russian revenue seems to not have been taken on board the impact of it, both even on the, 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 the US and the EU itself, um, but much less for Africa, Asia, and the Pacific. Um, and that is not occurring in a vacuum because we are coming out there for almost a 20 year period of structural adjustment. Where Africa in particular was um, advised, discouraged, from maintaining the food security that it had and told that it would be it should rely on um, the global markets 
right? So many African countries certainly are not food producing anymore, they became food importers. And none of these were taken into account by the proponents and the advisors, including the governments themselves, to begin to secure food. It, it, it was no secret that Russia was the second um, world's wheat producer and Ukraine the third, and that Russia is also a third oil producer. These were not unknown phenomena that when you begin to put in place financial and monetary restrictions and sanctions, that we would have um, indeed have impact on developing countries. And none of that seems to have um, perpetuated. And even if you thought the war was going to be a simple thing, like lasting three months, it's not lasting. And I don't see any uh, any of the G7 discussions, any discussions around how do we address the financial inflationary and other impact. And now to add to that, we have that we already knew that we'd have a direct impact of on um, emissions because of war, definitely. But we now also have the longer term impact, um, which is that many of the countries that were uh, high level um, emissions reduction had made prediction commitment on the climate accord to keep um, global warming below 1.5 are now turning to coal or, or, or so we have that increasing and that has significant implications again for issues of refugees um, both climate refugees and I think some of the common thread that I've been picking up as I listen um, to the presentations that was going on um, of course uh, another point I want to make about we know that sanctions by themselves don't do much right they haven't done a lot except um, impose collective punishment on the average citizen of these countries so we also need to look at that we saw that in Cuba Iran North Korea Syria um, so definitely how we um, to liberate those kind of response need to be taken into account. Um, so both Hela and Shrina um, in talking about Egypt talked about the, the sort of main theme I would say from the pre-presentation and the context of the discussion that we're having is about conflict, right? Um, there is a local generated conflict, regional conflict, and then there's of course the um, unjustified incursion or invasion, let's put it bluntly, of Russia into Ukraine. These generate issues, um, as uh, Hala said, um, they exacerbate existing regional issue and regional dynamic, especially in terms of uh, chronic food issues, which I've already said we need to look to the global economic about what it, why it is that after just six weeks, six months, even after a month of war, we were seeing food shortages in Africa and Asia places that prior to the last 10 years and 20 years of social adjustment were themselves abundant food producers. And that has lessons for each of our governments who have abundant agriculture and not supporting our farmers and have been dependent on the global market for food, for basic food. Um, this is not about separating from the global market, it's about ring fencing and protecting. We notice that the, the developed countries have a lot of wherewithal and a lot of um, degrees of freedom to protect their market to release oil the us has released release oil reserve and others of, of all these kinds of things but many developing countries do not so what we hear both from sri lanka and from egypt is that conflict results in um, uh, rising food prices increased malnutrition that's on top of all the other food, um, exacerbation of food and fuel prices um, Professor Lee has uh, um, talked about some of the issues, and I listened to the the webinar that occurred two days ago, and it was I want to really honor and thank the women that spoke, particularly from Russia, who are organizing the anti-war campaign at really significant cost to themselves and family, and also the refugees from uh, Ukraine. And I think one of the interesting things that I I heard was. Uh, uh, which links to some of the points that were made earlier about the the sexual and gender-based violence that accompanies conflict and uh, impact on lack of access to reproductive health was one of the, the the point that was made by I think it was a journalist from Russia that when the Ukrainian women came in who had been sexually abused and needed reproductive health, particularly around abortion, and they were aghast to find out at Poland that, that their country had a, achieved a higher level of access to these things in Poland, which again points to the nature of our, our 
a build up of our health care system and, uh, and whether or not we protect reproductive rights and those and have uh, health care for people, women who are abused by sexual and domestic violence as occurred in the pandemic or as occurred now under these different kinds of conflicts. Um, I am I'm sorry, other, I'm, I'll have to yeah. ask you to wrap yeah. up if you don't mind, please. Yeah, okay. so I Last wanted word. to flag two other things. One is, of course, climate. It points to the need for the, the developed countries to honor the, the, the commitment made at Copenhagen and reaffirmed over and over again, including the Paris for the um, climate finance to support developing countries. We'll be seeing if the climate warms up, we'll be seeing a lot more climate refugees and various kinds of things. We also need for them to really take strong measures to reduce reduction. And we also need for developed countries and the G7 to do something about the debt crisis because what we're yeah. seeing is the increased interest rates by the central bank, in particular the Fed, yeah. is increasing debt burden uh, along with the food prices, energy prices. So we have we need a more systemic solution. The IMF is now fighting with Zambia and in Barbados and we are fighting about it. But we don't need individualized pressurized situation that mm -hmm. have us have it to, to agree to IMF terms. We need a systemic issue mm -hmm. taking into consideration all that has happened, the pandemic, the war and everything. Thank you. Thanks very much, Mariana. Thank you. That was brilliant. And uh, of course, what Mariana has helped us to do is understand the macroeconomic situation and the macro social, macro political and the macro environmental um, conditions that this war is happening in because again wars and conflict don't just happen in a vacuum <laughs> they happen with in pre-existing uh, conditions which are which you know range from macro to micro and these are you know um, and Mariam has raised some of the most critical issues here on related to debt uh, structural adjustment the kinds of supports that governments were giving their economies their majority of their peoples or not um, climate and of course the relationship between all of these and global commodity prices and restructuring and, and um, the availability of finance. So now uh, I hand over to Preeti to walk us through some of the questions and uh, comments that are coming in. So uh, yeah, Preeti over to you. Uh, thanks so much Armani. My God, that was such a rich uh, sharing and I really it's a hard task to pay attention to the chat and thank you everyone who has putting comments and questions and all. So I will just read few out um, that have been uh, uh, shared. I think uh, many from many countries, people have commented on not just food insecurity, but the larger issue of food sovereignty that a lot of women and indigenous communities from Global South particularly, have been fighting for years and how that system has been eroded, resulting in the current food crisis also. So that was one uh, comment that uh, came from many of the uh, participants. Then there were comments about that, uh, you know, how does this global reordering uh, that we are seeing and uh, how does that impact? Uh, when there is so many, uh, even, um, you know, comments around food insecurity and food sovereignty came from uh, Latin American participants, especially uh, also sharing from Brazil, where like high number of people are suffering food access insecurity. And uh, because of the current situation in countries like Brazil and many of the other global south, the governments are dismantling many of the previous programs which provided food access. And this we are seeing again with the pandemic and the economic uh, distress, so the crisis with the pandemic caused, and then came a uh, further crisis with the war and food crisis uh, uh, has brought and what the governments are doing. We saw the total collapse of Sri Lanka, of course, was Sri shared in that. So uh, I would also like to... Um, uh, the other comment was, uh, you know, in interest of like global political interest, who is actually gaining or who has 
who's benefiting from this uh, war in uh, Ukraine. It's important for us to talk about. And it's important to take into account that, uh, okay, women, children, people on the ground are suffering, but then there are global powers uh, in the global economy with political interests that control the work world and who are benefiting. So this was share, uh, shared from Clara in Ecuador. I hope with uh, Clara with translation, I did justice to the question you raised. I'm going to raise all and then invite the panelists to comment on them if that is okay. Uh, then there was a comment coming from, uh, uh, you know, um, I, the person is saying that the world trade that exploits nature and people, especially women and children, gain strength in war, in migration and exploitation, not only in labor, health, education, violence, but also human trafficking. And this is an analysis, again, from uh, one of the women in Latin America. Uh, so, again... What is being pointed by these comments is the power struggle uh, that women are facing on the ground and highlighting that irrespective of the war and we talk about the suffering, there are always certain countries and people who are benefiting from that. There was a question then that was raised, uh, which was that it seems that many Global South leaders are supporting Russia as a way to get back at the West. Are ordinary citizens feeling this way too in Global South? How should Ukrainian feminists respond to this? So these were some of the comments questions. If I may invite any of the panelists, if they want to respond to it, further comment on it. Uh, one was, of course, a direct question. There are a few more, okay. What about the law enforcement body action on Russia-Ukraine war at UN level? What are the major problems of Ukraine people are facing on reproductive health issues? The political leaders are playing any peace dialogue within Russia and Ukraine. Uh, this was from Rajin. Uh, so, handing it over, Sharmali, do you want to or do, do any of the panelist or uh, Mariama, do you want to respond or pick up on any of the comments uh, that have been put forward so far? I can, I can talk about it. Yeah, go ahead, Shreen, go ahead. Go ahead. So with regard to Sri Lanka's eroding human rights record, it's very interesting the Western world has been taking a tough position with regard to access to justice for affected people. Very interestingly, the co-chair, co-groups and all these people are U US and UK and Canada. And so very interestingly, our leaders are also playing this card of the now the new block, this uh, China-Russia block, uh, to, to fight it out. And they play this card of going, getting close to Russia uh, or not to condemn Russia for uh, uh, whatever they are doing, or they get a bit closer to China and Russia to play that card of, okay, now if you are tough on us on with regard to the past atrocities that are committed, that we would level ourselves uh, with Russia. And also like this, this geopolitics is very important for us. Many of us who have been working on human rights issues, particularly access to justice for affected people. Having said that also like with regard to food crisis, I think our food crisis also partly we could have sorted, I mean, at least reduce the hunger and starvation if this war has not happened, U Ukraine and Russia war, because Sri Lanka exports a lot of tea to these two countries. And also we import, uh, we, are, we are totally dependent on Ukraine for the wheat products, um, you know, like, uh, and also soybeans, the protein and all those things. So that's, that has been cut off. And then fuel, I mean, we have been kind of threatened by the Western world not to touch, you know, Russia to get the fuel. Uh, we could have easily got very cheap fuel. So now after all these negotiation, very interestingly, India gave us uh, credit and Bangladesh and now Saudi Arabia is giving us credit for fuel. Why not Russia is a question. And also very interestingly, when the struggle happened, they were branded by our new liberal leader, uh, who has been supported by the West, uh, particularly the US, UK and all. 
it's calling the uh, the the protesters marxist fascist you know very close to these countries the countries that we are talking about so it, it is an interesting dimension for us who have been demanding for human rights on the one hand with the un and the western countries and on the other hand the whole card that is being played by the global west in order for us to not to approach china uh, or uh, russia uh, in order to get uh, of uh, you know like grants or the uh, the fuel credit and all those things and very interestingly imf's number one condition with regard to sri lanka's debt uh, restructuring is to go and negotiate with china first you negotiate with china and come back so i wonder why uh, other western countries couldn't restructure sri lanka's uh, debt why we are, they are pushing us to go to russia so uh, sorry china so it's very interesting how these uh, global west versus this new, new new powerhouses and how it's playing this politics thank, thank you thanks shreen i know i'm running over time but i wanted to quickly also see if anyone else wants to do a quick comment but very short we still have three more speakers and we are running a bit behind uh or in the interest of time if you allow me i can bring in the other two speakers and then we see if the time permitting we can have the conversation discussion yeah, yeah. Uh, i think later. we can we can we can speak at the end if we have time that would be better okay okay uh thank you hala so uh sharmali can i hand it over to you i think uh i'm sure our discussion will respond to how global south is whether supporting or not supporting and having a neutral position on the war in ukraine uh but sharmali handing it over to you um okay i'm not seeing sharmali maybe i can uh introduce the next presenter uh our next presenter is fabiana portado uh from brazil um Fabriana, uh, are you there? Yeah, okay, go ahead. So can I start? Yes, please do, please do. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Preeti Shamali and all of the organizers uh, for the invitation to share a bit with you and for organizing events which emphasize and disseminate um, issues that unfortunately still, issues and stories that unfortunately are still very little known and disseminated. So my name is Fabina Furtado. I am from the northeast of Brazil, a professor at the Federal Rural University of Rio de Janeiro. My field of research and activism is related to political ecology, more specifically on environmental conflicts due to extractive capitalism agribusiness, mining, oil, and other energy and infrastructure related projects, as well as the new liberalization and financialization of nature. And a major part of this work has been trying to, to comprehend and strengthen voices regarding the impacts that this development has on the lives of women and the ways that they relate to resist and re-exist in the process of protecting and defending their collective territories. That is from where I speak. No, I'm currently in the city of Sao Paulo as part of a course that we are co coordinating with the Hoselushin Group Foundation on women in the defense of their territories, bodies, land and waters. On my way to a region called Vale do Ribeira, which is a, part, a major part of the Atlantic forest, known for its environmental, but also for its cultural wealth, formed by various communities such as indigenous, and Afro-descendant rural communities that struggle to protect their territories and promote agroecology in resistance to various threats from agribusiness and the green economy. So how can we contribute to this debate on the impacts of the Ukrainian-Russian war on women in the South, more specifically in Brazil? I tried to briefly bring a few general and then specific issues, mainly related to what has already been said, how the war is deepening rights violation and violent um, mechanisms already in place in our countries, no? mainly due to, <coughs> to Brazil's dependent and subordinate role in international financialized capitalism and the liberal authoritarian government currently in, in place. So Brazil is already a champion in violence against land and environmental defenders, 
genocide against the black youth and feminicide. Violence against women has been on the upward trajectory for years now. Brazil has been in the top positions in the global ranking of countries with the most case of violence registered by global witness. Right? A country known for its impunity with profound structural class, race, <laughs> regional and gender inequality, uh, inequalities. With a land struggle that dates back to colonization and slavery. And so while today 1% of the largest property controls 70% of agricultural land, mainly in the hands of white men, 84% of properties with less than two hectares dispute only 12% of all land in Brazil. And 50% of Brazilian government annual budget is earmarked for paying interest on public debt that goes to bankers. So it's a country in structural wars. No? And we know that wars and crises are business opportunities, opportunities for capitalism to reinvent itself. So now for very specific <clears throat> impacts, mainly uh, related to inflation, how the war has increased prices in an economy that has already been devastated by an authoritarian liberal government and by the pandemic. A government which has been dismantling all social and environmental policies and program while legitimizing crimes and violence. This has a direct impact on the price of energy and food mainly. In a country where the total number of people going hungry has exceeded 33 million. Only four out of 10 families have full access to food. More than half of the Brazilian population lives with food insecurity and, and the violations of food sovereignty. No, the country has regressed to a level equivalent to that of the 1990s. As already mentioned, hunger is regionally based, it has gender and has race. The, the numbers are, uh, are even higher in the north and northeast of the region, no, in households where the women are uh, the reference person hunger has risen from 11.2 to 19.3 percent and this occurs mainly in families uh, headed uh, by the black population. Eight out of ten Brazilian women are in debt. They are, they are the majority of, uh, also amongst those with overdue debt, a direct consequence of a slower recovery of the labor markets and inequality in regards uh, uh, to salaries, no? uh, and due to the responsibility they take on no, in regards to their children, families, and sometimes even communities. No? This, uh, this is uh, also important to, to mention that most of the food that we eat is not produced by internationalized export-based agribusiness, but, but fa family farmers, and that 70% of agroecology in Brazil is produced by women. At the same time, we women have less access to land. So very quickly now on the issue of energy. No? Continued and deepened investment on coal and oil and infrastructure related projects and even nuclear energy as been uh, mentioned by the European governments will be mainly exported from Europe to seven countries like in Brazil. At the same time, the European Commission has proposed what they call long-term structural reforms and energy transition to reduce dependency on, on, on Russia for energy. But what does this mean? In practice, it means reconfiguring capitalism to maintain old and create new mechanisms of exploitation and expropriation, new types of extractivism. So we see wind and solar energies, hydrogen that are far from being clean energy, reproducing all types of dynamics related to traditional forms of energies like privatization of territories, violation of environmental rights, noise and visual pollution, sexual violence against women, loss of land, removal of communities and militarization of territories. And what does this mean specifically for women? And then I, I will be uh, ending my part. It means a work overload because the women are the ones that have been responsible to take care for the sick, the children, the elderly impacted by degradation and pollution by threats to their food rights and sovereignty. It means more exploitation and other forms of violence against the bodies and minds of women and girls. Sexual um, exploitation, you know, impacts on health, physical and psychological due to pollution and the use of pesticides on reproductive health. The denial of women as political subjects not recognized um, in policies and programs and in the rare moments that there are cases of rep reparation. 
No, it means the denial of the relations and knowledge that, not, that are not based on hierarchical dichotomies, nature versus society. And all of this has already mentioned being intensified by an authoritarian misogynistic government that has since in power dismantled and attempted to dismantle all laws, violated rights and promoted a narrative that legitimizes violence. Uh, so in terms of, of moving forwards, no, uh, we push forward to rethinking our words and debates. No, uh, so transformation, thinking about transformations and not transitions. No, promote the defense of the territory, bodies, land, and waters. So relate the expropriation of territories to the expropriation of the bodies of women. Discussion on 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 recovering collectives and the commons, and repoliticize the debate, repoliticize life. This project, the war is based on violence, on deaths, and not on, on lives. As Lorena Cabinau, an indigenous community of feminist states, we're talking about bodies that surrender themselves to the struggle. So we need to protect processes, uh, promote processes capable of healing these territories, bodies, lands, and waters. Bodies that are suffering from diseases, from stigmatization, from patriarchy, racism, displacement, criminalization, and legal judicialization of their actions, bodies that seek political energy to resist and act against the multiple matriarchal, colonial, racist and capital oppression. So addressing healing as a personal and political act to dismantle oppressions and to liberate women and emancipate their bodies. Thank you very much. Thank you, Fabrina. Thanks very much for those very inspiring uh, and, you know, linking what's happening geopolitically uh, in the world but also in our territories with our own agency as women and as feminists. That's very important. Thank you so much. And now we move uh, to South Africa. Um, have, I'm happy to welcome Yazini, Funeka Yazini April from South Africa. Funeka, over to you. Yazini, sorry, I should be correct. Yes, thank you very much, Chairperson. I would like to begin by thanking the organizers of this important and critical event. I will also acknowledge Ms. Priti Daruka, um, the co-founder for the BRICS Feminist Watch. And I would also like to acknowledge Ms. Sibulele Poswayo, who's the executive director for the Inequality Movement in South Africa, who seconded me to, be, to attend this very important event. Um, I'm going to do a PowerPoint presentation. So let me just quickly um, turn it on now. Uh, let's see, let's see, let's see, let's see. Okay, so my presentation will basically be on the impact of the Russia-Ukraine war on women in BRICS countries. I um, was going to do a comparative of all five countries, well, four countries. Um, as we all know, and I think the speakers have alluded to that, this war in Ukraine comes at a time when the countries globally are still struggling or trying to recover from the uh, effects of the COVID-19 pandemic. And suffice to say, the poorest in the Russia-Ukraine war are women who are typically hardest hit in these instances due to food insecurity, despite their role in agriculture. Um, and there's a fact here that according to the FAO estimates, women produce more than 50% of the food grown worldwide. That means almost half of the world's agricultural workforce is women. Therefore, due to the war, food insecurity has produced a negative impact, particularly on women-led households from income to health and education. So I indicate for the purpose of this presentation that the main outcome of this war um, has been food insecurity due to issues of fuel that the previous speaker alluded to, uh, fuel costs that relate to transport costs, and then you have your grain your exports, blah, 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 blah. Um, the key question for my presentation is what is the state of food production and 
challenges for women in contributing towards food security in BRICS countries. The methodology that I used was a comparative approach of women farmers in BRICS countries, but however, due to time, I'll only present the summarized findings. The key finding that I have is that South South countries are not doing enough to empower female agricultural farmers to mitigate challenges raised by global crises such as this current Russia-Ukraine war. Um, my findings also demonstrate that uh, there's a need to empower women for food security, not just for their families, but for overall national and global economies, because agricultural gender inequalities remain strong and women farmers are particularly at risk of hunger, especially um, also with their families, especially when this crisis strikes like the Russia-Ukraine war. Um, out of the findings, looking at all the four countries, which was um, I excluded Russia from this because the data was difficult to get. It was um, Brazil, uh, China, South Africa, and India. So out of all these countries, one of the key issues that came glaring, uh, there was a common uh, theme that was a problem, which was the issue of land access. So there's a need for the BRICS countries to abolish all measures of land inheritance requirements. And also another challenge that came out was that some countries like in South Africa, um, in countries like in Brazil, actually all of them, China too, there are very good laws written to ensure that women are engaged in food and security. However, the implementation of those laws remain a serious challenge. So I also propose that in the BRICS, uh, uh, amongst the, uh, uh, in the BRICS countries, we need to have a monitoring an evaluation process that should be established as an oversight to, to basically ensure that the constitution and all regulations on, 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 on gender and food security don't uh, collect dust in terms to land access. The other problem also is finance um, and credit access. It's been very problematic also, particularly in Brazil, South Africa, and India. China is a little different. In China, they don't look at gender to say, oh, you're a woman we're going to try and help you like here in South Africa I say oh the women 20% okay in China they don't care if you are productive you're a good farmer that's all what counts whether you're male or female so finance and credit in China is based on on, on ability the issue of gender doesn't really uh, is not contextualized that much um, but anyway um there's a need though to still abolish in out of these three countries to abolish gender specific barriers, um, especially when it comes to credit because most of these women do not have land that they could use maybe as a surety and all those other measures. And um, if they did that, it would help definitely feed a hungry world. Then the third thing is the lack of feminization of food security itself within BRICS. And so I argue that you need to have feminization of agriculture and BRICS um, because at the end of the day, the BRICS, the Russia-Ukraine war is not going to be the last global event we're going to have. We had uh, the COVID-19 was another crisis. We will have other issues later on. So there's a need for BRICS to urgently feminize agriculture and food security security for future crises such as these. In other words, the BRICS should implement advanced uh, food security measures with female global farmers regarding food security, as in the China case. China is a very good case of their cooperatives and their agricultural reserves, which has really helped cushion them during this current uh, uh, food uh, global food insecurity that is going on right now. Um, I also argue that we need to establish a conceptual, a conceptual framework within which to define the different dimensions of agricultural feminization and its expected consequences. Lastly, I also say that we need to establish a BRICS program design. You know, for example, we have, can have something like a BRICS Women Empowerment in Agricultural Index for Global uh, Crisis Emergencies.
Then the other finding uh, uh, relates to the issue of commercialization. China is the country that has excelled in this in terms of commercialization, the value chains, uh, your cluster economies in terms of agriculture. Um, because when I look at the other BRICS countries like Brazil and South Africa and India, most of the women are, 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 are doing farming basically as small holders. They are not part of the global value chain. And so maybe there's something we could draw into as BRICS countries. Um, the other thing that came out was the lack of recognition. Um, the women in most of these countries um, are treated more as if they are just uh, they are farm hands even though they are doing most of the work. I was interested in, I saw in, in, in India, the women there work about 3,300,000 3, more hours versus men who work about 1,500 hours or something. The, the stats of the working um, I was just with the farm labor is 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 crazy. Um, then there's the issue of violence. Um, female farmers, particularly in Brazil, from what I saw, it's a, quite a, a hectic issue and really needs to be denounced by the heads of state uh, because it's serving as a threat to food security. Then there's also the issue of discrimination that's predominant in the BRICS countries, also in Brazil and in South Africa. Um, so, and without discrimination, we would probably have agricultural yields, yields that would rise up by, would rise by almost a third of the women in farming if they had the same access to resources as men, which would result in about 150 million fewer less hungry people in the world. And this is according to the United Nations, by the way. That's how much impact we would have as women if they were much more, if they were taken more seriously in the agricultural sector globally. I would just uh, close by a quote from um, former U.S. President Barack Obama when he once said, communities that give their daughters the same opportunities as their sons are more peaceful and are more prosperous and develop faster. So I close by saying women can play a significant role on global food security, create economic prosperity and mitigate food consumption during crisis situations or global activities such as uh, COVID, uh, the global Pandemic, pandemic on COVID-19 or the Ukraine, the Russia-Ukraine war. I was told I have only like five minutes, so I cut this very short, so I'm done, uh, Chairperson. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Azini. Uh, that was brilliant uh, to pack so much, so much analysis and so many observations and insights into five, six minutes and from the BRICS perspective. That was really, uh, you know, Hats off to you. I know this is really important what you've done for us. Thank you, especially because this is a webinar organized by the BRICS Feminist Watch. So we really needed that coming together from the BRICS perspective. And now uh, I, it's my great pleasure and honor to hand the pulling together of all the threads to a dear friend and colleague, Anuradha. Anuradha Chinoy, Professor Anuradha Chinoy. Uh, thank, you, uh, thanks, yeah. thank you. Thank you. Thank uh, you, Preeti and uh, Shal. This this was indeed a, an excellent webinar, a great panel. And I have to um, pull together the, the threads actually of Fabiana uh, and Funeka. And I don't think there's really any need to because there was so much clarity in what they said. And I'm especially grateful to Fabiana for bringing in something which was very necessary and that is pointing to some of the root causes and that is this neoliberal globalization, which has been absolutely enforced also on the global south uh, on account of a, a, a large number of uh, the global south's own long-term historical weaknesses. And uh, so I'm not going to really pull together their threats, but I'm going to come to some of the broad conclusions uh, which came across from this webinar. And it appears to me, and mind you, some of these are not uh, my own judgments, but what has come from uh, uh, this two-day uh, webinar. It seems to me that this uh, Russian aggression, and I was underlined, it's a Russian aggression on Ukraine. So it's, it's not a war of both sides. Uh, the Ukrainians are defending their, their nation. 
uh, even if there is also a proxy uh, geopolitical war, which is also going on. So there are several wars going on, but there, and that is uh, left, the first level is the aggression by Russia, and then there are these other wars. So uh, this uh, aggression and the other levels of war actually mean different things for uh, different people and different women, especially depending on where they are located. Uh, and for the global south, particularly for, for women in Ukraine, it means they, have, they are also victims, they are resisting, uh, they are part of the new kind of uh, Ukrainian nationalism, the carving out of uh, the, the, you know, uh, etc. Uh, for Russian women, they're obviously divided. There are many who hate this war and are resisting it, but have been oppressed and don't have the right to say so. There are others uh, who have bind to the narrative that, uh, you know, they were also, Russia was under an existential threat, whatever it is, but for the women of the global South, I would agree with uh, what all the speakers have said that this means basically a food fuel fertilizer crisis, which is very severe in addition to layers of new militarization. And um, therefore, when there is this kind of crisis, those who are already marginalized get even more marginalized and suffer more. So this is primarily women, but especially women from more my marginalized communities. So uh, for, in for instance, in India or in Brazil, it would be women from the indigenous communities would be even more marginalized because there is a class system. Besides the gender system, besides patriarchy, let's not forget, we are functioning under this neoliberal capitalism. So um, there, this food security is extremely severe. Second, the war has also meant going back, uh, going back from many of the achievements by the women's movement. All wars do that. And now wars are no longer, no, no longer local. They become internationalized. And this particular aggression of Russia on Ukraine has global dimensions. And that is why BRICS Women is discussing it today. Uh, the global dimensions uh, vary, but for women, the bottom line is that there is a going back from the gains of the women's movement. There's an increase in gender-based violence. There is an increase in the idea that men are there to protect, and those women would get accepted who accept militarization and other militarized women uh, and uh, the rise of these kind of uh, nationalisms. Third. Uh, in then there was a direct question about the response uh, from the global south because a large part of the global south, of course, almost all the global south except for a few um, abstentions, I think about 35, 24 abstentions and 10 didn't vote in the um, UN General Assembly. Everyone has condemned this aggression and has called for a negotiated settlement and peace. I mean, I don't know how that can happen until uh, Russia actually moves out of uh, Ukraine or there is some kind of understanding which doesn't, there's nothing on the table uh, as yet. And there doesn't seem it's going to be a long war of attrition uh, where Ukraine is, is just suffering so much. It's incredible. Uh, that uh, they're even being able uh, to fight back. Uh, and and um, uh, there's so much news about the arms, where they are going, uh, etc. Et so uh, really uh, the uh, response from the states of the South are in keeping with what has happened in the South, especially in the last 30 years, when there were moments of peace in Europe, when Russia, you know, China was a partner in globalization and Russia was bending over backward to become part of the West, 
but they were refused. Uh, what was happening in the South is that we were having repeated wars of intervention, Iraq, Syria, Libya, Afghanistan, and there was no a real attention on these wars. Uh, and at the same time, um, you know, for example, a million people were killed in Iraq alone. Barack Obama, who the last speaker uh, quoted, he dropped 20,000 bombs in one year in Iraq. So this is in the background of uh, people in the global south, the amount of refugees and how they've been treated, of how they had to be, they, how they drowned in the Mediterranean rather to be landed or returned, the fact of the lack of international laws to deal with conflicts, the fact of, uh, you know, what uh, Fabiana said, this kind of uh, uh, the multiple oppressions which have increased. And in addition to that, in the South, we face our own authoritarian, increasingly oppressive governments, which has made the women's movements or human rights, etc., into a subject which cannot really be discussed because you fear the state. They're coming after systematically after dissent. So the hollowing out of democracy also adds to uh, the, you know, the kind of suppression of the women's movement and maybe also to their self-censorship. So uh, really, uh, therefore, um, there is this uh, hegemonic masculinity on the one hand, and it's increased with this war. Uh, and the other hand, I just draw your attention to, today to the UN development, uh, UNDP report on human development, which has come out today. It was just released today, which says that one out of 10 countries has gone back after decades of development, they have gone back uh, into a de-development. They have gone back into food insecurity. And the reasons they give are three. One, COVID. Second, uh, the Russian aggression and the war which follows. And third, climate change. But they do not point to the pattern of growth which has led to all these three. Uh, to this kind of uh, neoliberal capitalism, to the withdrawal of, uh, and, and the huge amount of social inequalities. So uh, really, I think um, if we come out with any statement or, or what our conclusion should be is one, we oppose war. We want a status quo where Ukraine has its sovereignty and territorial integrity. Uh, we would like that the, the, the state of Ukraine also safeguards minority rights, just like other states, uh, that democracy remains important, uh, and that um, uh, women in the BRICS and elsewhere suffer on account of uh, war, patriarchy, uh, uh, climate, uh, the uh, ec ecological damage, uh, and militarism. So I think that's what uh, my conclusion would be. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Anu. Thank you. That was uh, that was really amazing, and I think you did actually pull key threads from the entire webinar, from all the speakers, and from Mariama's points. And I think you pulled it all together for us. And I think one of the most important um, you know, points that you raised were how during that period of relative peace for Europe and many of the North countries, uh, the South has been under occupation in conflict, in turmoil, and at the same time subjected to extremely, um, yeah, extremely, uh, you know, draconian on one hand political regimes, but at the same time, draconian uh, economic and financial regimes coming from neoliberalism. And we've, as we've all noted that the rise of authoritarianism and fascism in the last 10 years is not de-linked from neoliberalism. They've gone hand in hand. 
So thank you so much for pointing these out and bringing the whole thing, the, the, the entire webinar together as a Global South perspective. Now, unfortunately, we don't have time for Q&A. Um, and so I request Preeti also to join me so that we could make some closing remarks here. And uh, what I, just from uh, my side, what I'd like to say is that this is a conversation. It's a conversation that we're having now. It's a conversation that's been going on among, uh, you know, people who believe in peace and injustice and people who are feminists and ecologists and, uh, you know, activists for, uh, you know, resisting militarism, patriarchy and ecocide that we, that, that, that accompanies these, um, you know, these, these trends. So these conversations have been going on since the beginning of the war, and they have been go going on during multiple wars and occupations, because war and occupation, unfortunately, did not begin with this or will not end. And, you know, we've been facing them continuously. So from our side, uh, we would like to perhaps try and draft some kind of a commentary or statement which we will share with everybody uh, for comments for, a, you know, it's difficult to pull together a common, one common political position. Uh, let's see if we can try and do it. But even if we can't, this is a conversation that we need to keep having. And, uh, you know, I thank you all from the very bottom of my heart and honor to be a shared this space with you. Uh, Preeti, over to you. Yeah, no, Sharmani, I just wanted to just join and say thank all the presenters and, uh, uh, I think it has been just fabulous. Both the webinars have been just fabulous. The honesty, the commitment and what women have bravely come forward and shared. And I'm just, I'm just uh, uh, greatly appreciative. And I hope that uh, this space uh, has uh, provided us in forging, uh, you know, understanding and building solidarity. And as you said, that we do want to challenge ourselves if we can come up with some kind of a statement or some kind of key points um, that we collectively can put forward with, uh, you know, and share it with others for inputs. Uh, that I think would be wonderful. But I also wanted to thank our uh, translators. Uh, thanks to them, the webinar became accessible to a lot many people. And I wanted to apologize to all those who have commented and asked questions and we haven't had time to pick them up, but we will save the chat and we will continue this conversation. I think we, this is just the beginning, I would say. So let's continue this conversation and let's keep talking amongst ourselves so that we can really build our common ground as feminists more solidly. So thank yeah. you, thank you everyone. And thank you to the technical team and very big thank you to all the participants in all both the webinars for making this possible. Thank you. Let's keep thank talking. You very much. And organizing and resisting as feminists. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Bye-bye.